Welcome back. With this lecture, we embark together on the last leg of our long journey through archaeological sites that reveal to us some of the important developments in the world of human religion. And we are going to change our focus now from those religions of the past, those tribal religions, the religions into which people were born and that they accepted unquestioningly as they did their language, their territory, their own identity within the society. It was something inherited along with all of the other cultural components that made up that particular community. We are now moving into the world of religions that dominate the world today. And these are religions often of choice, religions of conversion, religions to which people adhere consciously, having made a decision, that is what I believe in. Now those religions that dominate the world scene today, with one exception, tend to be in the class that are called revealed religions. We've encountered some individuals, rulers, to whom God spoke through dreams and visions. So we know that back there in the earlier world, there was a sense that you could have important spiritual and religious truths revealed to you by the gods themselves. An example of that would be Tutmosis, asleep under the Sphinx, and being personally addressed by Horus of the Horizon and given a task, clear my statue of sand. Or we can think of Pachacuti again, there in Cusco, receiving the words of Inti, the sun, in a dream. But we are now talking about religious reformers who through time have, have created the faiths, the creeds, that many people in the world live by today. One of the great world religions, of course, we've already touched on. When we were at Angkor and looking at that great temple, we were aware that it had been dedicated by Surya Varman II to a specific god in a choice that he made, breaking with tradition. He made that great temple at Angkor sacred to Vishnu. He regarded himself as the incarnation of Vishnu. All of his predecessors had worshipped instead Shiva and created temples to that god. Hinduism is the all-embracing name that we give to that faith in which Shiva and Vishnu and Indra and many of those other gods of the familiar Hindu pantheon play such an important role. That is not a revealed religion, but it is one that is very important in the world today. The religions we'll be looking at in this sixth and final part of our course, which I have called Communities of the Spirit, are religions that can be traced back to specific founder figures, to whom the truth was revealed and who shared that revelation with all people, making it possible in most cases for anyone to become part of that religion by choice. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Some of these religions are tied also to national identities, but in general this is what separates the revealed faiths from those older traditional religions linked to family, clan, band, tribe, nation, that were just part of your identity. So let's have a quick review of which revealed faiths we are speaking about. There would be Judaism, revealed through Abraham and Moses. Zoroastrianism, which is the focus of our first lecture right now, which was revealed by a prophet named Zoroaster, um, called by the Greeks Zarathustra, and you'll sometimes see his name written in that way. Uh, he, he may have lived about uh, 600 BC. He may have lived long before that. We'll talk about the archaeological and linguistic evidence for when this particular founder figure actually taught. We then go on to Buddhism, uh, founded by the figure called the Buddha, the Enlightened One, who was actually a, a prince in India named Gautama. Then Jesus, founder of Christianity. And finally, we go forward a little bit and we come to Muhammad, founder of Islam. With those faiths, those five faiths, we have a set of religions that now dominate the world scene, along with Hinduism from that older uh, set of faiths. And they differ in, in a significant way, not just in the matter of consciously being chosen by people and certainly consciously being held onto by people in the face of persecution. 
which all of those faiths have experienced at different times, or members of all of those faiths, they also have a different kind of approach to what religion is. For the first time now, religion becomes a creed, a set of beliefs, things you believe in, so that it's possible for people to look at you and not be aware of what religion you adhere to because it's going on in your mind, in your thoughts, in your beliefs. Those creeds, and that word comes from the Latin credo, I believe, those creeds will often talk about the nature of the gods, how they were created, exactly what are their identities and what is their relationship to the world and people living in it. Creeds will talk about observances of certain uh, rituals, prayers, sometimes, though, though much less so in these revealed religions, sacrifices, and certain days on which religious observances are marked by adherents of that faith. Matters of ritual purity may be in the creeds. Ethics suddenly appear. Right and wrong become very important. Uh, lists of, of the uh, things you must not do if you will be a, a saved person who in a redeemed way will go into paradise, heaven, a beautiful existence after this life. There have been bits and pieces of those thoughts in previous religions. We can think of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is steering the soul through the duat, the underworld, and includes a judgment scene. But in the Book of the Dead, if you know the right answers to that immense negative confession of the things you did not do in life, the knowing the right answers is, is more important than what you actually did. The feeling of true morality is less important than being prepared with a road map that will guide you through that difficult encounter with the great beings after your death. The elemental idea of right and wrong, of good and evil, light versus darkness, truth versus lie, becomes very strong with these revealed religions. And let's start with the one that makes that set of dualities more clear than any other and that is the religion preached by Zoroaster, this great prophet who lies behind the religion called, after him, Zoroastrianism. As I said, some people would put his dates around 600 BC. Certainly the first set of people who seem to show us the signs of being adherents to Zoroaster's religion with its supreme deity, Ahura Mazda, its veneration of fire, its belief in serving the truth and rejecting the lie, a very simple creed, they are the Achaemenid kings of Persia, kings with familiar names like Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, the kings known from their encounters with the Greeks and written about in great detail by Greek observers and Greek enemies of their kingdom. The tie to Persia, that realm of which those monarchs were king, uh, served as kings, great kings, uh, is going to be central to Zoroastrianism. It will be associated from that day to this with the land of Persia and with the Persian people, although it ultimately spread to many others. Zoroaster, as I said, was believed by some to have lived around the time that the Persian Empire was being formed. Uh, Cyrus himself belongs to the early 6th century BC, and he seems to spread this faith, this simple faith of uh, Ahura Mazda, the supreme god of Zoroaster, wherever he goes. On the other hand, we have to remark that the Persians adhered to an approach to religion that is called henotheism. That's not a very common term because it's not a very common religious outlook. You spell it H-E-N-O, T-H-E-I-S-M, you'll recognize that theism as the, the uh, word for a, a system of thinking about God, as in monotheism, one God, polytheism, many gods, atheism, no God. This theism that was part of the um, uh, henotheistic idea is that you have your own God, you have your own faith, and yet you accept the religions of others. And certainly it was true that within the great Persian Empire, the largest empire the world had ever seen up until that date, which reached from the Indus Valley in Pakistan all the way to Macedonia in uh, northern Greece, 
and from Arabia and Egypt all the way up into the Russian steppes, and which included many people. Uh, religious freedom was the order of the day. There were those who adopted Zoroastrianism. It did become a great world religion at that time with uh, probably millions of adherents. When you think of the chunk of the world and its population that's covered by that territory, you can think of how grand and important it must have been. But at the same time, other faiths were, were not merely tolerated but supported. It belongs to the Persian period, for instance, that famous uh, uh, record in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible about Cyrus, the conqueror, having conquered Babylon and established Persian rule there, sending the Jews back to, the, they had been in this Babylonian captivity as captives, sending them back to their homeland and even uh, endowing a temple in Jerusalem with money from the Persian treasury, uh, a promise that was ultimately fulfilled in a later reign. So that is their approach, and this is what makes us think today that they are Zoroastrians. And there's another element, too, for associating these Persian kings with Zoroaster. They call themselves gardeners. And they're the only monarchs I know of that do this. You hear lots of titles like defender of the faith and protector of the realm, but the gardener, uh, they were very interested in trees and very interested in cultivating the earth and presenting themselves as nurturers, as cultivators, as gardeners. Uh, Xerxes on his way to Greece stopped by a beautiful sycamore or plane tree and made it a, a shrine. Well, that gardening essence comes out of Zarathustra's or Zoroaster's teaching where he says that cultivation is good, the nomadic warrior life, the herding life is less good is something that should be turned away from. And there is a beautiful phrase in the uh, one of the Gathas, one of those sacred songs attributed to Zoroaster himself, he who cultivates crops cultivates righteousness. And the fact that these kings, who do not mention Zor uh, Zoroaster himself in their inscriptions, although they do talk about Ahura Mazda and show that great god of Zoroastrianism up in a fiery chariot in the sky, riding through the heavens. They do not mention him, but the fact that they are calling themselves gardeners, along with their supreme god being uh, Ahura Mazda, and along with their veneration for fire, convinces me they are indeed Zoroastrianists, the first um, great monarchs to have adopted this faith. Before I get to Zoroaster himself, let me describe another element of that earliest expression of this religion that we have very vividly described by the Greek historians. When the Persian kings went to war, and certainly the Greeks knew all about that because they were frequently the targets of those wars since their Greek lands were at the western fringe of the great Persian empire, those kings marched along accompanied by holy men who carried altars on which sacred fires were burning. These fire altars belonged to a group of people, one of whom would have been called a magus, and if we put that into Latin plural, it is magi, Greek plural, magoi, but in the more familiar English pronunciation, magi. These are the figures that appear in the nativity stories in Matthew, uh, in the Christian tradition, where they have seen a star, because uh, the, the magi of, of the Zoroastrian tradition, the magi of Persia, were star watchers, were venerators of the flame, keepers of the flame, interested in all things to do with heavenly light. And we'll talk about why the, the light of heaven is just as important as the flame in a moment. At any rate, according to Matthew, they saw a star, they followed the star to Bethlehem, and they are the first to venerate uh, the infant Jesus. Uh, Martin Luther, who knew his history very well, I think didn't like the picture of these men from another faith, these holy men of the Zoroastrian faith showing up at the manger. He called them Weise, wise men, in his German translation of the Bible, and that is the way they are often referred to, or, to dodge the bullet again, three kings, based on the fact that there are three gifts, so there must be three of them to have brought gold, frankincense, myrrh. We don't know the number of them. We do know that they are magi, these uh, central figures, these venerators of fire, these protectors of the sacred flame uh, from the Zoroastrian faith. Now, let's look at Zoroaster himself. We know about him from his own mouth only through uh, about uh, 15 gathas. These are hymns. They're a little like the biblical psalms. 
in honor of the supreme god Ahura Mazda. And in one of them, Zoroaster hints at something that's made explicit in the later writings, which were collected together in a great uh, a compilation of books called the Avesta. And one thing we should say about these, these revealed religions is they tend to be held by people who we can call peoples of the book. The revealed religion, and actually this goes for Hinduism as well with those great epics, but the revealed re religions with the uh, Zoroastrian Avesta, the uh, Hebrew Torah, the uh, Buddhist texts, the sutras, uh, certainly the Christian Gospels, uh, the Islamic Quran, it's written down now. It's become intellectualized in the sense that there is a, a literary text which holds the truth, holds the creed in very specific terms from which uh, people can depart at their peril or in the desire to create a new sect or a new interpretation, but to which the, the faithful will adhere. Uh, this core of the Avesta is those very early things, the Gathas, that Zoroaster himself chanted or sang and passed down through time. And they, they hint at what is later made explicit. He had a vision. He saw the great god Ahura Mazda, and he was instructed in his vision about Ahura Mazda. In the earlier Indo-European foreworld, and remember the Persians are an Indo-European people, like the Hindus of India, and like all the, most of the people living in Europe, with the exception of folks, folks like the Basques and the Finns and the Hungarians, these Persians had older gods, and Ahura Mazda had actually figured in that pantheon, that polytheistic seeming pantheon of gods. He was plucked out by, or in the vision of Zoroaster, seen as the supreme god, never created because he always was the sole thing in the universe that always existed, that his symbol was light, and he instructed Zoroaster in these dualities, light versus darkness, truth versus the lie, good versus evil. Ahura Mazda was opposed by a great enemy, Arima, A-H-R-I-M-A, Arima is one of the names for this enemy, who is the lie, who is the darkness, who is the evil. And these two are locked in a contest for the world which Ahura Mazda created and made perfect and beautiful, but which was sullied, stained, darkened by this evil spirit. And so life is a contest. And each of us must decide whose side are we on? Are we going to be a soldier for Ahura Mazda, or for Arima, the force of darkness, evil, and the lie. Another element that ties our, our Persians in, as I said, is that they, the only thing they thought they needed to teach their sons was to ride well, shoot an arrow straight, and tell the truth. Something so elemental is that bedrock of what was revealed to Zoroaster, and when he had to refer to the enemy in a simple, straightforward forward way, he just always referred to the lie. And we put it with a capital L when we write it in English. The lie is what opposes Ahura Mazda, the great being. Certain elements of the older Indo-European faith were rejected. For instance, uh, there were a couple of gods who were war gods. Indra, who we already met riding an elephant in that story that tied in with the churning of the sea of milk at Angkor, and Mitra or Mithras, who we'll, we will meet in a little, uh, a little bit as we get to Rome and look at the mass of religions that were active and surging around the time that Christianity rose to prominence. Mithraism is descended from him and descended from the Persian pre-Zoroastrian faith. These two gods were rejected by Zoroaster. This is where his reforming quality comes in, that reforming quality which is so strong in most of these founders of religions, that they are here to correct as well as to enlighten. And these gods were condemned along with their warlike ways. You are a soldier for Ahura Mazda and for good and light and truth by your own actions. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be modest. You're supposed to be helpful. You're supposed to till the ground. You are supposed to be a good member of society. You're not supposed to be an ascetic and go off and live on a mountaintop with a strict dietary regime of near starvation, thinking that's get, getting you closer to holiness. 
This is a religion that forces you to stay in this real world, forces you through your own actions and the way you treat others to serve the good. And at the end of time, if humanity will all turn away from evil, darkness, and the lie, the world can be saved, creation can be redeemed and purified, and a new age will begin. Before we get to the archaeological evidence, one more, one more point about Zoroaster. Uh, he wanted people to pray. He instituted through his teachings a regimen of prayer five times a day at five specific hours of the day, each time in the presence of light or fire. So the fire becomes a sacred emblem of Ahura Mazda, but you can also get it by opening the window to the beams of sunshine coming in, or by standing under the starlight or the moon at night, which is why the Magi become so important as they're in their astrological functions. During that time of praying, where you, you recite those gathas, those ancient, ancient hymns, which to archaeologists seem very clearly to date from about a thousand years before the time that is normally attributed to Zoroaster himself, about 600 BC, uh, from those hymns you would achieve that feeling of peace and unity, you would re-pledge yourself to Zoroaster's uh, ideal god, prime god, Ahura Mazda, and you would wear a, a certain simple dress that, that was called the path, a simple undergarment, uh, the idea of you being a pilgrim through life, and you would tie and untie a girdle, a cord around your waist that also was tied with that idea of the path, the way. How do we see Zoroastrianism in archaeology? First of all, we see it in the symbolism surrounding the kings of Persia of the Achaemenid dynasty, that dynasty founded by King Cyrus in the 6th century BC and finally thrown upon the scrap heap of history by Alexander the Great around 330 BC. That great dynasty worshipped Ahura Mazda and placed his image on their, on their monuments. Zoroastrianism then goes underground for a while, although the activities of the Magi are still well known because the Greeks and Romans find them fascinating and write all about them, and they learn about Zoroaster and they write about him too. But there's a great resurgence in Zoroastrianism, first in the time of the Parthian dynasty, those who ruled Persia and opposed the Roman emperors, and then ultimately in the time of the Sassanid or Sasanian dynasty, the kings like Khazro, uh, uh, Khazro, who was a Sasanian king, came to the throne in 531, ruled to 579 of our era, who make the spreading of the Zoroastrian faith a prime element in their campaign, which on their western border is waged against the Christian emperors of the Byzantine Empire. So it is a faith that has survived many vicissitudes, it's come up against many, many other faiths, and it's part of holy wars. Now at this point, the pacifism of Zoroaster being forgotten, to try to establish and expand the faith. The fire became a very important element of state religion in the Sasanid times, and there were supposed to be three great sacred fires. The fire of the kings and the warriors was one. The fire of the priests was the second, and the fire of the farmers and herdsmen was third. And it is in seeking one of those places that we come down to earth and attach ourselves to an archaeological site, one of the really intriguing ones anywhere in the world. It's at a place called Takti Suleiman, the throne of Solomon. That is an Islamic name applied to a hilltop up in the north part of Iran, just south of the Caspian Sea in the province of Azerbaijan. On this hilltop, on a plain that lies more than a mile above sea level, surrounded by even taller mountains, which are volcanic in nature and which contain mines for gold, silver, lead, mercury, amethysts. In a, in a plain surrounded by these mountains was this rise of ground, this hill, with a circular lake on top of the hill. This was called the Throne of Solomon in Islamic times. Its older Zoroastrian name is uncertain. That lake is not fed by ordinary springs, but by thermal springs attached to the volcanic stuff underground. The hot water bubbles up, it fills a perfectly circular lake. If you fly over it in an airplane, it looks like you're looking down at an eye. A blue water with sort of smoking, steaming stuff on the surface in cold weather. 
Around it was built a circular city, and around the city a circular wall. Those walls were supposed to be 40 feet thick, with three gates. This site was well known as a Mongol stronghold. After Islam had taken over the area, the Mongols came in the 1200s. A grandson of, Kup of uh, Genghis Khan came and conquered this part of, of Persia, established a seat of government there, and ruled there, and built the Great Walls, and built his own administrative center on top, surrounding that sacred circular lake. All that was very clear to archaeologists who began to come to this site in the 20th century. But as they got down through the Mongol or Mughal layers, as they have come to be called, at the top, into the area below, they realized that there was an older Sasanid city there with a palace in it and a temple of some kind, and then that even below that there was a village going back to the Achaemenid times, 6th, 5th, 4th century BC, the time of those great kings who worshipped Ahura Mazda. It was with great excitement that the Germans who were working on this, this dig discovered some bulle, some um, clay tablets with, with uh, writing on them. Uh, bulle often are wrapped around other clay tablets uh, so that they, they have sort of envelopes of, of clay and, and other texts and tablets inside. But these bulle had on them uh, information that showed that this was the site of one of those three sacred fires. It was in fact the fire of the kings and the warriors the fire that was called Gushnasp. And the, the excitement of rediscovering the, the place of one of the three great sacred fires of Zoroastrianism was extreme. They found the place where the fire had been. It was on the north side of the lake. They found the great hole in the floor where that uh, fire altar had apparently been taken out. They had thought by, by, by robbers and looters and raiders of a later period. They found the, the little room where they imagined the ashes being taken and then distributed uh, to pilgrims. They, they saw the ceremonial way that led up the steep north face of the hill where each Sasanian king would come and walk barefoot up the slope of the hill following the example of Khosro, the great conqueror who, who uh, took over that hilltop and made it a, a central place of worship and made that one of the three great official fires of the Zoroastrian religion of the 6th century AD and later. All of this was discovered and at last one of those, those flames and its home had been revealed. So our community of the spirit in this case is the king of the Sasanian dynasty who is climbing the hill and staying in that private palace, the palace that's between the mysterious water and the sacred flame, and the pilgrims who come, who come during the Sasanian time when it is the official state religion, but who keep on coming after the Islamic conquest, when they are now a, a minority, and even up until the time of the Mongols, still coming. Those pilgrims, those who have chosen to adhere to this ancient faith, they are the ones we are speaking of who are the community of this spirit. And they ultimately uh, left because of persecution, went down to Mumbai in India where they have formed the group known as Parsis or Farsis, people of Persia, who still acknowledge Arhura Mazda and the Zoroastrian faith today. I have a particular interest in this site because of the geology. It looks to me very much like a site called Mount Olympus, far to the west of Takti Suleiman, the throne of Solomon, over in Turkey, a place where fires spouted out of the mountainside naturally and where there was a great flow of travertine or calcite from, yes, thermal springs. I believe the link between the flames and the travertine flows from the thermal springs at this site in Turkey is repeated at Takti Suleiman and that that hole in the ground where the German archaeologist imagined an altar had once been is in fact the the very place where from the sacred earth itself one of the three great fires of the Zoroastrian faith emerged, not fed by ordinary fuel gathered by humans, but created in a very ancient and primeval way that carries us back to some of our earliest thoughts in this course about the earth itself being the source of religion. Here we find its mysterious gases and waters feeding the flame of one of those ancient revealed religions.